what I'm presenting here at the meeting is work from my laboratory based upon preclinical mouse models of uh, mammary and squamous cancer, where we've identified pathways regulated by the immune system that are pro-tumorigenic. And in understanding those pathways, recognized where targets are for therapy, and then utilize some of those therapeutic approaches in combination with chemotherapy to show that we can provide survival advantages to tumor-bearing animals. And then the translation of that in the context of a clinical trial we're currently running in women with metastatic triple negative breast cancer. We started looking at the role of the immune response. Well, I started looking at that biology when I was a postdoc with the recognition that as animals developed benign hyperplasias in their epithelial uh, compartments, that subjacent to those compartments was a prominent stromal response, matrix remodeling, activation of fibroblasts, but also tremendous infiltration by a diversity of immune cells. That that biology was so prominent in benign disease, it just made sense at the time that that biology was fostering progression. And as a postdoc, I identified some subsets of myeloid cells that when they were removed by either immunologic or genetic mechanism means, therapeutically, um, we could repress progression of epithelial cancers that were being driven by dominant oncogenes, supporting the hypothesis that chronic inflammation acts as a promoting force for solid tumors. And so 20 years later, um, and really trying very hard to dissect which leukocytic populations represent pro-tumor biology versus anti-tumor biology, we've recognized in skin, in mammary tissue, in pancreas, and now in mesothelioma, which subsets of immune cells provide a survival pathway for tumor cells versus which provide a survival advantage to the host so that we can selectively turn off those that are enabling tumor cell survival. So in squamous disease, um, and by analogy in pancreatic cancers, we find survival pathways are fostered by humoral immunity. So B cells do what B cells do in that they provide um, aminoglobulins that form complexes with complement proteins. As vessels and tissue become angiogenic, like all other serum proteins, immune complexes are deposited into the microenvironment of an evolving tumor. What we have identified is that these immune complexes, instead of triggering um, an ADCC response that would be anti-tumor, what immune complexes do in neoplastic tissue is that they instead activate FC gamma receptor positive myeloid cells into a pro-tumorigenic state. And in that state, those myeloid cells provide survival factors to neoplastic cells, angiogenic factors to vasculature, as well as factors that lead to inhibition of the tumor parenchyma by CD8 positive T cells, suggesting then that therapeutically minimizing humoral immunity or blocking humoral immune mediated activation in myeloid cells would provide a survival advantage by limiting that protumor biology. So we're writing clinical protocols now to go into pancreatic and patients with pancreatic cancers with rituximab. Um, rituximab was really one of the first anti-cancer reagents turned antibody approved by the FDA for patients with B-cell leukemias. Um, 
in contrast to dogma at the time, it was thought that this would be uh, dangerous for patients. But what we know now is that patients can live long-term without activated B cells, because rituximab doesn't deplete plasma cells. So they're still, patients are still able to respond to pathogens and you know, deal with tissue responses. So we're writing protocols to treat pancreatic patients, pancreatic cancer patients with rituximab, as well as um, looking at how B cells are activated um, downstream of the B cell receptor um, and treating patients with uh, molecules that block that signaling pathway. So BTK inhibitors and or sick kinase inhibitors. We're not in the clinic yet. We're at the point now where the preclinical data is compelling enough that we're writing clinical protocols. Um, whereas I think that we, well I hope, we will see um, positive responses. I don't anticipate we'll see durable responses with these approaches as standalone therapy. Instead, what I anticipate is that we'll need to do smart combinations with additional immune therapies, additional targeted therapies, and certainly always in the combination with cytotoxic chemotherapy or radiation therapy. Targeted therapy provides the advantage that you can block the driver mutations that are leading to sustained proliferation. Chemotherapy provides the advantage that you're going to kill rapidly dividing cells. That's an advantage to immune therapy because that will by definition release antigens that if you can bolster a CD8 T cell response, then the CD8 T cells have productive targets to kill. The immune response to cancer has long been overlooked. Um, I think the data is now absolutely compelling for us to take immune therapy seriously um, in combination with targeted and chemotherapy. But recognizing that even if we understand every mutational driver in a solid tumor or hem a hematopoietic hematologic cancer, that targeting those pathways alone likely will not provide the kinds of durable survival advantages that we need to then perhaps die of something else where we can turn cancer into a chronic disease. I think really only layering in the power of immune therapy will provide that.